Welcome to Disability Arts Online's latest event, launching DL Williams' poetry collection, Interdimensional Traveller. I'm Colin Hambrook, editor of Disability Arts Online. I'm an older white man wearing glasses and sitting in my home office. I'm delighted to introduce our audience to the work of D.L. Williams. D.L. is a deaf, queer, bilingual poet working with British Sign Language and English. D.L. approaches the subject of bilingualism in their poetry with humour and gravitas. Through the medium of poetry, D.L. celebrates deaf culture and the difficulties of finding a sense of belonging with wit, wisdom, and a touch of science fiction. DL has a deep interest in translation and how their work can be made accessible to signing and non-signing audiences. They've performed around the UK, including the Edinburgh Fringe, the South Bank Centre and the Albert Hall, as well as in America and in Brazil. Joining DL through a visceral celebration of deaf and bilingual poetry, we will see three other poets performing. Nadia, Nadia Nadaraja is an actress having performed in several definitely theatre productions, including Shakespearean plays such as Love's Labour Lost, A Midsummer Night's Dream and Hamlet, amongst others. In addition to her acting career, Nadia is a teacher and poet and is fluent in five sign languages. Raymond Antrobus is a poet, educator and writer who has been performing poetry since 2007. He's author of three collections, Perseverance, Can Bears Ski, and all the names given. In 2019, Raymond won the Ted Hughes Award for new work in poetry. Collie Metcalf is a deaf performer and member of Tease Women Poets. She describes herself as a writer for stage rather than the page. Her bold and fearless style of performance uses BSL and movement, bringing her words to life, drawing the audience in and offering a glimpse of her world. Before any more adieu, I will hand you over to DL Williams, who will introduce their collection, Interdimensional Traveller, recently published by Burning Eye Books. DL, is a white woman in her early thirties with glasses and short brown hair. They will invite each poem in turn to give a reading from their work. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for that introduction. For this event, there are two BSL interpreters the first is Elvia Roberts. She is a white woman wearing a black long sleeved shirt, glasses and has a blue background. Um, she's got her hair very short. I'm not sure if it's white or blonde 
Um, I was actually playing with the young little bit there, so I didn't want to say it was white. I was going to call it distinguished, but I'm not sure if it came off the right way in BSR. I think it was fine. <laughs> okay, okay, I can do it again. Oh, right, okay. I didn't think that went well. Okay, uh, right. Okay, let's get it this time. I'm gonna do it again. For this event, there will be two BSL interpreters. One is Elvia Roberts. She is a white woman with short hair, wearing a black shirt against a blue background and she also is wearing glasses. The other interpreter is Tracy Tyre. She is a white woman with short hair, short brown hair. She wears glasses. She's wearing a dark top and is also against a blue background. So the first poet that I would like to introduce to you is Nadia Nadaraja. She's a Southeast Asian woman with dark brown skin. She has long dark brown hair and she will, she's wearing a dark top with stripes across the neck and the background is red. She has composed a beautiful video of a BSL poem for us because she cannot be here today, so she's provided us with the video. And it's a real pleasure to show that to you now. Deaf Mind by Nadia Nadaraja. Thoughts signing. Eyes listening. Picture creating. Read wording. Memory. Holding details. Our thoughts. Signing in spaces. Signing in spaces. Seeing details. Tiny. Actions moving. Actions moving. Look around. Eyes. Listening, spotting always, focusing details, tiny. Eyes tiring. 
look around. Imagine, picturing, space, creating, showing details, tiny, location, placing. Look around. English alphabet reading. Words coming, words coming. Looking details, tiny. Translation, processing, translation, processing. Look around, understand, meaning. Memory, bringing. Flashing back, flashing back, visualizing details, tiny. Messages receiving. Look around. Thoughts. Signing. Eyes. Listening. Picture, creating. Read, wording. Memory, holding details. Wow. Thank you so much, Nadia. That was a beautiful video. Lovely to see how you used all the different camera angles, very clear display of the different aspects of BSL. Fantastic. Now, our next poet is Collie Metcalf. She's a white woman with curly shoulder length hair, kind of ginger blonde, middle aged, wearing a red top with a white background with a bit of a pattern on it, but primarily white. There might even be a cat walking through the picture. I first came across her work about three years ago, a lovely poem that really expressed her personal experience. So I'm very pleased to be able to present her today. Thanks, DL. Um, this is a, um, a poem that I did during the middle of the, uh, the first lockdown. Uh, this is called Mask On, Mask Off. Mask on, mask off. Eyes peering over the top, emotions and expressions erased. What did you say? Do you sign? You don't know how. You see, I can't read your lips through your mask on, mask off. 
a conscious consideration of virus control, March to June, FaceTime and Zoom, friends meet online instead of coffee shop and park in the sunshine. Mask off, mask on. It's different, it's new. Changed ways in these strange days, we do what we do to get through, to stay safe. Monitors on, connection strong, connection, together, linked, joined, support, part of a process, strike up rapport, reconnect with pals not seen for, check in and check on, accept, mask on, lips gone. Times agreed, invites sent, calendar updated, link and ca password cascaded and we're on, hooray! The first day of on-screen meets, waving and laughing and crack overlapping, catching up. It's vibrant and alive, cups of tea and glasses of wine, you show me yours and I'll tell you mine and mask off, mask on like a child outside a sweet shop, aching to go in and gorge. I watch the animated talk, faces jumping from one to another, friends laughing and already I'm mask on, mask off. I join in the moment, open a chat. What did Jan say? Oh, we're a minute, Collie, I can't type that fast. Or oh, hang on a minute, or, oh. <laughs> or, oh. Words fade. Sorry, Collie. Mask off, mask on. They forgot that I'm deaf. I speak like them and I manage so well that they, bye, same time next week. Mask on, Zoom off. I'm exhausted frustrated, bereft. I pretend it's okay to say would make them feel what, but how do I feel? My deafness has always been my deal, my thing to manage. As mask times continue, I find the courage to be me, to be deaf, not hearing, not pretending, not acceding or accepting, not less than. My secret is out. My struggle is public and I, behind masks and without captions, I am lost. In real life, when I can see, still I laugh and copy them as they talk, their words mumbled, jumbled, unheard, quickly said, always, always on the edge of understanding online. It slipped their mind. I'm good at faking, but turn the laptop off and I shrivel inside. Cyber life has made me pause. Groups and mates and workshops have sped ahead. Friends forged their bonds, continued life, and I'm the little girl outside the shop window. Nose pressed on glass, looking in, wanting to belong to eat the candy, but mask off, mask on. I see you, the real you. You left me. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Collie. That poem was so impactful all the different stanzas, the different parts of frustration. I completely got it. Thank you so much for your performance today. Superb. Cool. Okay, so the next poet I want to present to you is Raymond Antrobus. He is a mixed race man, well built, has tattoos, wears a dark top, and the background, you'll see he's sitting in his living room, looks very comfortable, chilled, 
good for him. And he has achieved so many things. When I've seen his work over the years, he's done amazingly well. And I'm really grateful that he's giving us his time today. Over to Raymond. Thank you so much, DL, for having me. Um, congratulations on the publication of your first book. It's a huge milestone, a huge achievement for a poet, especially a deaf poet, um, a poet who is ambitious and gracious as you are. Um, so thank you for inviting me into this space. Um, I'm gonna read some poems from this book called All the Names Given. Um, uh, my, my surname, Antrobos, um, is often assumed to be a foreign name, as in a name that's not from England, but it is an English name. It is a name that is so English, so anciently English, uh, but it's become foreign to itself. It's an old Norse name. And um, it means between the woods or between the shrubs. And uh, I went back to Cheshire, to this village, and I um, went back to my mother, whose name I inherited from, the Antropos name, and uh, my grandma often took, spoken about it. And this is a poem which unfolds um, throughout the day of being in Antropos. Wherever you are, you touch the bark of trees, different yet familiar. Shesla Milosh. I can be fiendish, I can't be English, say ghosts, some with shaved heads, some with cane rolls, muttering themselves into notebooks. The barman's eyes and the antropus arms become sharp gates when I claim to be English. My mother born here, my grandfather, a local preacher. Oh, well then welcome, he says, or land your angels. There are enigmas in my deafness. I stare at the crest of gold lines behind the bar. I scar the cross of Davidic's line behind the bar. Hear my ghosts say fiendish, English. The barman calls the whole village and my name goes to rounds. My mother drives us to Antrobos Hall. Two German shepherds surround the car. I climb out, it's raining. The dogs jump, their paws scraping a new coat of earth in my chest. A farmer appears, asks if we are descended from Edmund Antrobus. Sir Edmund Antrobus, third baronet, slaver, beloved father, overseer, owner of plantations in Jamaica, British Guyana and St. Kitts. I shake my head, avoid the farmer's eye. My mother and I tread the cemetery of St. Mark's Antrobus and see everyone buried here is of Antrobus. We look up and see hawks in the ash trees and sparrows in the wheat fields and the rain-soaked stones of Antrobus. And after we walk the slick mirrors of wet roads, the curves of Barber's Lane, between trees, I take a photo of our shadows flung over the red berry bushes like black coats.
the next uh, poem I'm going to read is called Language Signs. Uh, my grandfather uh, was a preacher. I'm a, I guess I'm a, I'm a, my uh, grandson of preachers. And um, one of the most precious inheritances I have from my grandfather is um, his sermons, a box of his sermons, which I read every now and then. I go into it. Um, and this is the only poem I've written so far where I've able to, been able to kind of incorporate some of the language in his sermons. Um, and the two, word, the two words I pick out from the language, not just because I think they are uh, evocative words in English, but also because I think they're evocative signs. Uh, so the sign for mercy, for example, and, uh, and failure uh, are the two words that are picked up um, from his sermons. Anyway, um, this poem is called Language Signs. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak in the air. 1 Corinthians 14, 8 to 9. J.K. Antrobus, grandfather, I dreamt you returning your reading glasses to your eyes, opening your Bible, pointing at the words you couldn't say. You pointed at mercy and failure, and then you pointed at your white hair and your lips, and then at the ceiling of your church as if it were the roof of your own mouth. And I understood as much of the stone plaques from the walls or the pews which were wood, a word which once meant tree. All the men that raised me are dead, those bastards, are one self-pitying prick of a son. How do I bring back men who couldn't speak, men lost in books, drinks, graves? Where do I turn, knowing they left the hat, the hot taps running? I want to say, sorry, come to me, cut the hedges of your face so I can read your lips. And the last poem I'm going to read is called For Tyrone Givens. Um, Tyrone was a friend of mine I went to school with. He was really popular in school. He could dance, sing. He was good at football. Um, he had these really bright blue hearing aids. Uh, he got on really well with both the deaf and the hearing kids. Um, and that was a little bit of an anonymy, 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 that word, anonymy, sorry, anomaly, anomaly. That was a bit of an anomaly um, uh, for him. And um, when I heard what happened to him um, fairly recently, um, I didn't know if it was going to be something that I was going to be able to write. But then I was asked to write a poem um, that responds to the um, human rights, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and I saw this article um, in there that said, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. 
And what happened to Tyrone was he ended up in a situation where he was put in prison uh, without his hearing aids. And um, he asked for his hearing aids multiple times. They weren't given back to him. Um, people will know that there is a, quite a strong link between um, feelings of isolation and, um, and depression. Um, that's often uh, linked with people who, who grow up deaf and don't have proper support. Um, so Tyrone uh, hung himself, he commits suicide um, in, his, in his cell. And only after that happened, um, did they look into the causes. Um, and it seemed to spiral from the time when um, he wasn't given his hearing aids. So um, this is a poem for Tyrone Gibbons. The paper said, putting him in jail without his hearing aids was like putting him in a hole in the ground. There were no hymns for deaf boys, but who can tell we're deaf without speaking to us? Tyrone's name was misspelled in the HMP Pentonville prison system. Once I was handcuffed, shoved into a police van. I didn't hear the officer say why. I was saved by my friend's mother who threw herself in the road and refused to let the van drive away. Who could have saved Tyrone? James Baldwin commit, attempted suicide after each of his loves jumped from bridges or overdosed. He killed his characters, made them kill themselves. Rufus, Richard, black men who couldn't live like this. Tyrone, I won writing awards, bought new hearing aids and heard my name through the walls. I bought a signed Baldwin book. The man who sold it to me didn't know you, me or Baldwin. I feel I rescued it, I feel failed. Tyrone, the last time I saw you alive, I dropped my pen on the staircase. Didn't hear it fall, but you saw and ran down to get it. Handed it to me before disappearing, said, you might need this. Thank you so much for listening. Big up DL, have a good day. Wow, thank you so much, Raymond. Really appreciate you giving us your time as a guest poet today, thank you. Okay, so now I think it's time for me to perform my poems and they're written so before coronavirus I would perform them I would perform them some in English some in SSE some in full BSL so I'm trying to show 
the audience, both the hearing audience, give them a little bit of insight into the deaf world of sign language. So I'd have the English and then sign supported English with that so they get an idea of that and then give them some poems in British Sign Language. So I thought I'd do the same today to show you the journey through the book. So the very first poem will be myself speaking and have sign supported English. So sign supported English, SSE, is where you have sign language, you have, but it follows the structure of English so you can speak at the time. It's not British Sign Language, just want to be clear about that. Okay, so, and, and then the second poem, actually this, the next two poems will be in British Sign Language. But the first one is called, These Hands Are Wider Than The Sky. These hands are wider than the sky. Because the sky they contain, the sun and planets and moon and stars and more they sustain. These hands are deeper than they can see, because the meaning they portray goes far beyond what you can see as all things they convey. These hands are just the same as sound. They judge them nine by sign. And they will differ if they do in how they touch the mind. Thank you. My second poem is called Who Am I? And it's a way that I found to analyse my identity. Here we go. Who am I? Raised in hearing culture. Late found deaf culture. Hearing identity have. Deaf identity have. Both absorbed but they grind and fracture who am i in the hearing world i'm labeled hearing impaired broken in the deaf world i'm labeled speaks well, half hearing, oral. I can speak, but do I fit in the hearing world? Sometimes. I can sign, but do I fit in the deaf world? Sometimes. Half hearing, half deaf, together becomes what? Who am I? Introspection, deaf, hearing, Woman, queer, androgynous, geek, traveler, my love of language, and so on, and on. All of these identities and passions, I see them all and they're all part of me.
traveller, language, geek, androgynous, queer, woman, hearing, deaf. At last, it all clicks into place. That's who I am. My last poem is called My Cat. And this is a poem I've done for a long time. It's an old favorite, it's light. And also I think there's something about being deaf in there, but it's also about my cat. My cat. Old? Time to go? Passed on. Time went by, missing feline company. I'm ready, heart ready. Went to cat home, looked around. First cat. licked its ass. Second cat. Whoa. Third cat. Dreaming mayhem. Suddenly, a lively kitten. Our eyes met. Beautiful. White fur all over. Oh. Oh, too much, too hyper, too young, too much, too. What's that? It's death. That's my cat. Some powerful words there, giving us feel for the depth and breadth of deaf culture and the poetry that inspires it. And DL, I was going to ask you um, a few questions and then um, about interdimensional traveller. Uh, it's very much about moving between worlds. And in many ways, the collection is like a roadmap describing a journey of acceptance. How, how important to you has the process of writing been in helping find the self-validation that the reader will find in your poetry? Mm. 
really important because for me, I think that writing and composing poems is a way of expressing myself, of getting those feelings out. Instead of having them all bottled up inside, I can get them out. So out there on the page or signed to camera. And I think about the, it's a structured way of thinking about the self and understanding what's going on and expressing myself. And so I think poetry really does help me in that way. And can you tell us something about some of the most important steps for you in your career as a poet and some of some of your highlights? Oh, well, I've done so many things, loads of different stuff. It's been an interesting variety of things I've done, to be honest. I'm trying to think. I think probably one of the main things for me was performing in Brazil. And that was at a big deaf festival, an arts festival. It was called the Folklore Surdo in Brazil. So it's a it's a Portuguese word, a fantastic festival of um deaf folk art storytelling um so and so many performers coming from all over the place can do workshops and performances and i was there and it was an incredible privilege both to be there to perform to show my poetry and to learn as well it was an amazing experience i've also performed at the albert hall and i was um, I guess part of the proms there. I'm trying to think where else as a key place. I'm thinking, yes, it was an accessible proms thing. So that was amazing being inside this colossal hall. What an experience standing on stage in front of all those tiered seats. And also, I've been performed at the Barbican. So that's Barbican and the South Bank Centre, yeah, a real range of places. Edinburgh, I've toured all over the place. There's so many things that have been, I think I've been, it's been a marvellous um, ca career looking back on what I've done. And now you have this collection published by Burning Eye. Um, they they described their mission as looking for the bold, the fearless and the strange, dispelling the assumption that performance poetry does not transfer well to the page. Um, can you tell us a bit about your relationship with Burning Eye and, and, and the publishing of, of, of the book? Well, so... So I don't know if you've heard the poet Stephen Light down. Mm -hmm. He's a wheelchair user and he was launching his first book of poetry in Bristol. So that was a couple of years ago and I was invited to perform there. He invited uh, three other disabled poets to perform there. So I went, did my performance and his editor was there spotted me, approached me after the gig and had a chat with me and invited me to show them my work. And the rest is history. So that's why really what I wanted to do is as part of my launch, I wanted to give other deaf poets a platform because Stephen gave me a platform and I want then to give something back to other deaf poets so that they can showcase their work to the world because there is so many different deaf poets out there with different skills. And Interdimensional Traveller is, is a, a bilingual collection. Can you, uh, can you say something about why you wanted to, to, to uh, produce a bilingual collection that's uh, 
really really interesting and unique thing about the about the book well i wanted it to be bilingual in both english and bsl because they're both languages they use and at the moment i'm studying to become a, a translator um, a qualified translator so i feel like I've got both languages, I have a connection with both languages and I've used both languages in my performance because I wanted my poetry to be accessible, to be fully accessible to both deaf and hearing people, um, people who sign, people who don't sign, to everybody. I wanted them, it to be fully accessible and I knew when I finally produced a book I wanted that to be bilingual as well, to reflect that, to be accessible in the same way. So my theme and my title um, in, within my poetry, my whole aim is to make it accessible. Whether people like it or not, of course, is a different matter, but it will be accessible. Thanks, DL. And uh, perhaps you'd... Um... Tell us where where uh, inter interdimensional traveller can be found. Yes, well, of course, from Burning Eye, from their um, website, you, there's all the information there to buy it. And I don't know if I should say the word Amazon. I suspect it will be somewhere there. For the BSL version of the book, there will be QR codes in the book, and then you can use those to access um, my poems and a kind of YouTube library online. So there's deaffirefly.com, um, which also has its own YouTube channel, which is deaffirefly.com. And then there are a couple of poems which are already online so those, those QR codes will link to the general online places as well. So all the QR codes will be in the book. So DL is saying, so, so if any of you have any questions, do you want to ask any questions? Collie. It isn't a question, really, I wanted to say it's amazingly clever to use the QR codes in the book to then connect to the signing. I think that is genius. Wow. How did you come up with that idea? Was it you or the publisher or? It's really interesting because the original plan was to have a book years ago, was to have the book and then a DVD with the book. So that's how the idea initially came about. And then when I was talking with the editor at Burning Eye, they said that actually DVDs are old technology now. Everything's digital. And with them being digital, you can have the QR codes, you know, it's like it's magic now on the computer. So that would also save money on the cost of DVDs very simple to just print the QR codes. So we went with that and actually that's a better idea. So this is our experiment with the QR codes and we'll see how it goes. And it's a way of having the two languages connected. Thank you. Superb. Can I ask one question? Um, so DL, yeah, my question is also about um, well, two things, process and um, the, the QR code idea, which is great. I've, too, I've been thinking about that. Um, the thing that I came up against in the QR code idea was kind of the cost effectiveness uh, that, and that there just aren't many um, or any actually that I know of deaf uh, editors or, or people that have that a deaf sensibility even. There aren't many of those in the publishing world. Um, 
So how did you find a way to persevere through that? And were there any compromises that were made in, in creating the book? Um, or do you feel like the, the, this is a book which is wholeheartedly kind of integral to you? Do you feel embraced or, or I should say aesthetically uh, complete with the book? Or are there other, you know, some things that you think about um, now that you think, oh, I, I want to do that differently next time or um, I want to create like different versions um, of the book. So I, I see like the QR code, for example, as one version of a book and then um, the written version of the book. And maybe when people come to see you perform, you can see the, the signed, uh, the, the VV or the VSL or uh, the signed supported English version of, of, of the book. Quite a huge uh, question there, but I'm, I'm interested to hear you talk about that. Yeah, that, it's definitely a big question. I'm not sure which part to answer first and how to break down the question. Just to talk about the QR codes, Burning Eye have dealt with those and there were two different types of QR code you can use. Uh, one is static, and then the other one is dynamic. So the dynamic one is much more flexible. The static one means that when you make the connection, that connection is fixed. You can't change whatever you've connected it to. The dynamic one enables you to connect it to something and then connect it to a different link and to edit that over time. So you, you can then change what it's linked to. So I thought I would be using the dynamic one, but in discussion with the editor, they explained that actually with the dynamic one, you have to pay a subscription to keep it open. Now, that's not feasible and they couldn't commit to funding that long-term. So, I completely understood that. So we're using the static version. And that's why we decided to have one website, if you like, one YouTube place where all the videos would be there mm. and they would be connected to that have a static connection to that QR code. And then that means that I can upload as many BSL poems as necessary to that place. And then if I need to change something, I will change it in the YouTube or website and the QR code and the link to that web address will remain the same. So that will never change. So it's complicated, but I've learned loads, I have to say, especially throughout lockdown, the last 18 months. Really, the original plan was that a deaf person would film themselves, another person would edit them, um, and it, then it would all be deaf-led, and then everything came to a halt, of course. So I have learnt loads. Um, can't believe how much I've learned. So, and to talk about the process and the different versions of it, well, at the moment, my only aim was to film all the poems and that is my 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 aim at the present and um, whether I'll do anything differently in the future I don't know but I want to get all I've got all the English there I want to get all the BSL there once I've got that I will be a happy person I'm not imagining using any VV I tend to use BSL much more but I think the book is a summary of where I'm at at this point in my life it's got my heart and my soul there. And when that's gone, what I'll focus on next, I really don't know. I think I'll be doing something completely different, perhaps a new poetry, something relating to art, perhaps ekphrastic, 
poetry. Hmm. So I've got a whole range of ideas sitting there. The world is open, you know, I could be anything. Is that all the questions I've answered that you asked? Cool, yeah, excellent. That's great, DL, that's, that's really useful as well. Um, can, you, can you go back a little bit, just tell us what ephrastic poetry is though? Ah, oh. well, it's something that I've only discovered recently. Um, it was a, must have been at a poetry workshop or something, perhaps a, we were translating poetry and they were talking about ekphrastic poetry. So it's a combination of poetry and art and visual arts. So you yeah. have, you might have a poem that, um, with, with the, the piece of art melded with it. So you have an artwork combined with the poem and somehow they are integrated. And I, I love that, it's very difficult to explain, but it is an absolutely fascinating concept. And so for example, I might write a poem and the way it's written, the that so the words might make the shape of something that resonates, the sh shape on the paper that resonates with the concept of the poem. Yeah. So you can then, you have a visual shape as well as the content of the words. That's, so there are that's things like that. You know, there are other ways of doing it, practic poetry, but it's yeah. something I'm particularly keen on at the moment uh, because again, it combines that visual, poetic, artistic mode all together. So that might be my next step. Fantastic. We look forward to uh, more of that. And uh, it's been it's been great it's been lovely to uh to see and hear your poetry and and uh also big thanks to to uh raymond antrobus and collie metcalf also for sharing some of their powerful words um some really really um strong stuff here today so um it just remains for me to to say a big thank you and and to encourage everyone to to go and by the book. Thank you.